Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Cabinet members and business leaders met this week for the first time since the Government of National Unity was formed. Chairman Screamer joins me to discuss some of the key outcomes. Hi. Hi, Chanel. Firstly, it was agreed that the focus of the National Energy Crisis Committee needs to be adjusted. Yes, you know, with uh, load shedding sort of de-intensifying, de waning, uh, there's going to be a need to be a shift if they're going to keep the crisis committee uh, because that was really what it was set up to do a couple of years ago to really tackle load shedding. And, but the thing is that we are in a major energy transition and there are crises emerging all around the, the electricity sector at the moment, not just at the power stations where the focus was over the last couple of years and getting the operations working, getting the money so that uh, Eskom could plan properly um, from the National Treasury. And that has now really been done, and we can see the benefits, especially of that capital injection uh, to Eskom, which has really allowed Eskom to plan, procure, and therefore roll out maintenance in a much better way at the power stations. And that, uh, that is now uh, leading to much lower load, sh well, no load shedding at the moment, which is great news. So NECOM really is going to be focusing on the other crises that are emerging in the sector. These are really system-wide crises as we transition from a very vertically integrated structure, a centralized structure of which is dominated by uh, coal stations in the northeast of the country, producing electricity for the rest of the country through a, a big machine grid that takes electrons almost one, one way. And we're moving to a system where it's going to be more bi-directional, there's going to be much more activity in the southwest of the country if we can get the grid capacity up uh, to evacuate that power. And that is the crisis that is emerging around the system now. How are we going to get that grid in place? Because it is constraining the, in, the integration of new renewable energy into the market. But it's not the only crisis. We're seeing a major uh, crisis around municipal utilities. And these are operational. Um, and uh, you know, so they're just substations that haven't been well maintained, uh, lack of crews, um, those operational elements, but they're also operational in the sense that with, uh, in certain cities there's been a lot of illegal connectivity and this is putting major strain on substations and we therefore having ongoing load reduction, which is effectively for those communities like load shedding. So that continues, so that is a crisis. But there's a financial crisis, and uh, there's a financial crisis that we see at Eskom, and we see that uh, these steeply rising tariffs, and at the municipal utilities as well, there's a crisis financially uh, where we haven't reached cost reflectivity, yet we are facing an affordability crunch from a consumer perspective, not just poor households. You know, uh, normal uh, middle class households are also facing difficulties around electricity bills and the steeply rising nature of those. And then the uh, obviously business, which was used to having very good, one reliable, but also very cheap electricity back in the day uh, from Eskom, that has now changed fundamentally and the electricity prices are no longer cheap in South Africa. There's not a industrial poli policy advantage or lever that government can pull. So those, those system-wide crises are going to be the, be the main focus now of the, of the repurposed NECOM and what some are calling NECOM 2.0. Government and business also want greater ambition from Transnet around its recovery. Yes, you know, I think there's, uh, the recovery at Transnet has been welcomed. The leadership and the openness to new uh, innovations and new interventions and to private sector participation has been welcomed. But the pace at which the recovery is taking place is still of concern to business and government. Transnet dipped to like 149 million tonnes of volumes a couple of years ago, which was really dismal, because it had done well over 226 in around 2018 million tonnes. And the recovery plan was to get to about 254 million tonnes last year, which they, they, they didn't meet. They got to about 250, 252 million tonnes and then to rise to 170 million tonnes during this current year. We've already heard that they're behind that tempo in terms of recovery, but that they've got plans to try and you know, claw back the losses that happened in the first few months of the year. 
and to get uh, to that 170 type million tons. But business and government are saying that's really not good enough. It's not even at the contractual levels that many of the mining companies want to move their, their chrome, their manganese, their coal, uh, those bulk, the iron ore. You know, we're below those contractual levels. And we're also below the level, and uh, the presidency suggests that this is between 200 and 220 million tonnes, where the freight logistics system is supportive of a recovery, including job creation. So anything below that, it's actually job destroying and, and, is, and, and is creating problems for growth and development. So there's a view that much more attention needs to be given to Transnet. Now Transnet has done a lot and has already signaled beyond the seven, 47 billion government guarantee that to get to a new level, they may need to go to the National Treasury for recapitalization. So I think that's very much on the cards. And it's going to be interesting to see now how the, the Transnet navigates this period because I think it is going to be about a money issue, but I think it's also about the, getting the reforms moving at a much faster pace. The, the, the logjam around, the legal logjam around the, the port operation at Durban Container Terminal continues, so we've got no certainty there about a private sector participation. And that really would be the model template for other terminals potentially and getting more private sectors into the port, private sector investment into the ports. And then the big thing at the rail, you know, we need this third party access. Now we've gone through this process of consulting a network statement and the tariff methodology. Uh, there was a lot of concern about the methodology and what it would mean for tariffs for train operators coming onto the network. That has now taken place and we now wait for the publication of the network statement without which not, none of this can really happen. And the date now is uh, either end of August, early September, but that really needs to move because it's going to take a long time before we can get this private sector activity on the rail and the ports. Uh, so we need to get legal clarity around the port, uh, port PSP and then we need the network statement. And then on top of it, to get um, transmit moving at a faster rate in terms of its own recovery plan, which I think is going to require some sort of uh, fiscal injection and taxpayer support. There was also some discussion on the future of Operation Wulindlela. Yes, it comes. Uh, this is the first meeting of government and business uh, since the formation of the Government of National Unity. And we know that the partners in the Government of National Unity, particularly the two largest partners, ANC and DA, are very supportive of Operation Wulindlela. And, and broadening Operation Vulindlela beyond what it is now, which is the freight logistics, which we spoke about, the electricity crisis, which we spoke about. We didn't speak so much about what's happening in the, the crime space and the, um, the law enforcement uh, and support that's happening there. That's very important support to the, to the judicial system and the investigation unit and um, the National Prosecuting Authority, very important support coming through there. But there's still a view that more can be done through the Operation Wurundjela mechanism. And three areas have been targeted. Municipalities, which uh, we also spoke about earlier, but that's a big crisis. Uh, the, the, the financial and operational and instability in, uh, of municipalities, that's going to be a big focus area. The second area is spatial inequality that persists with the apartheid uh, living um, uh, distribution or way people live and the, the racial dynamic around that, persisting well into democracy and looking to do more around spatial equality. That's another big leg that uh, Operation Wurundjela has been told that they should start looking at. And then digital transformation, which is the key to growth into the future. So those three aspects, what is going to happen? How are they going to be integrated into Operation Wurundjela? And, uh, I think the, the discussion, because it very much comes down to the capacity of business and government to really do all this thing. It's a lot of uh, executive time, it's a lot of energy, it's money. Uh, so, you know, I think the view was let's just take the step by step. That was the, that was the announcement that was made. And we slowly start integrating some of these additional pillars to Operation Wurundjera, but not dropping the ball on the three around crime around energy and around logistics, really, really consolidating that as a priority. So that seems to be what came out of the first meeting. Let's prioritize and 
consolidating, repurposing as we, as we, as we must with say something like NECOM, but consolidate that and then as we gain confidence there, start adding these three other elements of spatial inequality, municipalities, and then digital transformation. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.